putting aside the ethics and the morality of it, it's really not a good bet for stable economic growth or labor productivity or the health of the society. Actually, those communities in those countries that have greater levels of inequality tend to have worse health. And not just for the people at the bottom, but the people in the middle and even some of the folks at the top. Right? It's really interesting, right, to have such inequality. Even people at the top, by comparison to a lot of people in the world, don't have all that great of health outcomes. Like there was a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association a few years back that found that this country actually has the greatest level of anxiety disorders in the world. I really want you to think about it. Not, not, like, not like organic mental disorders, like schizophrenia, which are you know, oftentimes genetically encoded, so we're not going to have huge disparities globally. I'm talking anxiety disorders. That's not even a diagnosis that existed four decades ago, five decades ago. What's anxiety disorders like? I'm really stressed. And we have twice the global average, five times the average of certain countries that are in the midst of civil war right now. How does that happen? How do you have such great levels of anxiety disorders, depression, and actually also um, substance abuse disorders when you're the richest nation on earth, or at least one of them, the strongest nation on earth, but with relative privilege compared to the globe that is just sort of astronomical? Everybody in the country, uh, in some ways, astronomically privileged vis-a-vis -vis millions and even billions of other people on the planet. How do you have more anxiety disorders in such a place? Real simple. You see, when you have this level of inequality, even the people at the top are always on edge. They're always on edge because they're always looking behind them thinking somebody's gaining on them. Oh my God, right? They're coming for what I have, so I've got to build a fence around my community. I've got to have a gated community to keep myself safe. You know, I've got to avoid that neighborhood and that neighborhood. I've got to construct my life so as to avoid certain people because they are dangerous, right? And so in a way, even though you have huge material privilege and advantage if you're at the top of that pinnacle, which I realize most of us, you know, are not in that place, but, but you might have that and then you still have these various illnesses, if you will, which maybe would not manifest as much were it a more equitable society. So there's actually a lot of evidence that Brit Hume ignores at his own peril, which says that inequality is actually quite a problem. But putting aside the scholarly journal evidence and putting aside the morality and the ethics, there's also this little thing called demographics. And any demographer worth their salt will tell you, and it is an incontrovertible fact, that within the next 25 to 30 years, approximately half of this country are going to be white folks and half are going to be people of color. Now, you don't have to like that. I don't much care. Right? That's a fact. And you can either deal with it or you can move on. You know, I know there's some white folks in Arizona that aren't real happy about it and they're trying to stop it. I also know that the average age of white folks in Arizona is like 137. <laughs> So with a little patience and some good organizing, we can probably <laughs> And no, I am not advocating the death of old people. <laughs> do not tweet that. Do not put that up. Do not send out a message. Tim Wise advocating the death of old people. I'm not. I hope they all live really nice, long lives. I love me some white people, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> I love my wife, she is white. I love my two girls, they are white. That's what happens when white people make babies. I love my mama, she is white. I don't get along with my father, but it's not because he's white, it's in spite of that. It's about some other stuff that we don't have time to go into here. You understand? So, so I don't want these folks to die. I just know that everybody does. And age is highly correlated with when that happens. And that Arizona has the oldest white people in the country. That's a demographic fact. And the youngest brown folks. And now that's an important point. That's an important point, because right now what's happening in Arizona, and has been happening for five to ten years, is that the public infrastructure of that state, I mean the public schools, public transportation, roads, the, the things that we pay for communally, collectively, have been cut to the bone, right, because the power doesn't reside with the younger brown folk, it resides with the older white folk. So they're cutting things, and it's not because they're necessarily racist or because they're necessarily cruel, I mean some of them might be, but I don't really think that's the main thing, I think it's they don't see themselves in those institutions. They don't see them as, as really pertaining to them, so they're not necessarily cruel. They're just sort of indifferent to the fact that they're cutting the slats out of the very infrastructure needed to maintain a healthy state for their white children and grandchildren if they intend to stay there. It's not very you know, far-sighted. It's sort of short-sighted, but that's what happens when we're indifferent to suffering. We're just like, we've got ours, and so to hell with those folks. They can get it together or not, but by 2030 or 2035, whenever this demographic change is truly upon us, we're going to be a country where if we don't do something, and that doesn't mean we have to agree on what that is. We can have different opinions on how to address the inequality, and, and, and lots of those opinions are, are worthy of consideration. Okay, I'm not saying my way is the only way and that I've got all those answers. I don't. But, but I will say 
that if we don't do something to address it, if we don't take it seriously, as Brick Hume apparently doesn't on either a racial or class level, you know, now I'm just talking about on a racial level, but even just regular economic inequality is huge and vast and growing, um, even within the white community and within the black community and within the Latino community, right? You've got intergroup, intra-group inequality that's expanding. That's not healthy either. Um, if we don't take it seriously, we're going to come to that day, let's say it's 2030, so we're, you know, we're talking less than two decades from now, when half of the population will be people of color. How do we maintain a healthy society for anyone, including white folks? If we get to that day and half of the population is twice as likely as the other half to be out of work, which is the case now, black to white, brown to white, three times as likely as the other half to be poor, because that's the fact now, black and brown to white. One-tenth the wealth to one-twentieth the wealth on average, depending on which numbers you look at, but either one pretty bad, of the other half, which is white, because that's the reality now. People of color, about one-tenth to one-twentieth the net worth of white folks. Nine years less life expectancy than the other half. Double the rate of infant mortality, double the rate of low birth weight children born to moms as the moms in the other half. That is not a recipe for a very healthy society for anyone. I don't see how in the world we can maintain a healthy and productive culture or economy with that level of disparity. And I can assure you, you will not find, and I defy you, to show me one country that has ever survived with the levels of inequality that we are approaching. None of them have. And perhaps Brit Hume and his compatriots on the right believe that we will be the one nation to cheat history, that we will be the one nation that will be able to sustain itself as a garrison state where people can get behind their their, their razor wire and their fences and get their private security guards once we starve the public infrastructure of just about everything. Right? Maybe they think that we're going to be the ones to cheat it, but I sort of doubt it. We are going to have to figure out a way. Oh, and there's something I forgot when all that problem was going down a second ago. It's over now, so I'm back to what I need to tell you. So, and we can start it up again, it's cool. My father was a stand-up comic. I can deal with hecklers, I can deal with all kinds of nonsense. It's not a problem. So, here's the deal. So, uh, indifference to suffering, best example of all. Now, we got this Tea Party thing, and I'm not saying that everyone in it is, is, is a bad person. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but I will say this, I know what the origin of this was, and so do you, if you remember, if you were watching carefully a few years back. And this is, by the way, the, not the origin according to me, it's the origin according to the leaders of the Tea Party movement. They actually credit quite openly uh, this thing that a certain so-called business reporter, which is another word for an economist who doesn't actually have any economics background, but is good with a microphone in front of his face on television. Um, this business reporter named Rick Santelli, who's on CNBC, right, issued this rant for around the world. And Santelli uh, was on the floor of the Commodities Exchange in Chicago, which is a place where a lot of rich, almost exclusively white men, manipulate commodities in order to make billions of dollars. They, they don't actually have the skills to produce anything. Uh, they couldn't produce themselves a pencil, let alone a pencil factory, but they can move stuff around, manipulate money, manipulate currency, manipulate commodity prices, bet on whether or not the price of grain is going to go up or go down. There's an important skill. Right? It's, like, it's, it's, like, it's like thinking that it's an important skill to know how to play Texas Hold'em in the basement of your fraternity house or something. Which, I mean, I guess that's really cute if like, the only thing you're playing for is beer. But when you're playing with the global economy, it's not quite so cute, because when you crap out, so to speak, when you don't do well, like lots of people lose everything. So here are these guys in the commodities exchange who make way more money than any skill that they have would justify, right? And Rick Santelli is furious. Why is he furious? And he starts calling for a tea party. This is the first time that these words are sort of uttered into the universe in the midst of all this. And he says he's angry because the administration had just proposed a very minor